I would like to thank the college for sponsoring this event. We have Professor John Guslowski, who's going to read to us. I'd like to thank the English department and Brother Edward, the chair, who is in the audience. I'd like to thank media relations and uh, special events. And I just want to tell you, I don't have any prepared comments. I thought I would tell you a little about how my path and John's crossed. A little over a year ago, we were doing a book on immigration. And we received a very curious piece of prose called Wooden Trunk from Buchenwald. And my wife and I were reading this and thinking, this is very curious. It was a prose piece about a wooden trunk that had been constructed by this man's, the author's father, in a Nazi concentration camp. And it traveled with them across the ocean to America. And it contained all their belongings. And th the story was entirely about the metaphor of the trunk. And I don't want to go into any kind of analysis of it, but that was our first introduction to John. And we just loved it. We said, this is fantastic. We have to publish this. And then when it came time to do what turned out to be battle runes, we knew, even before we put that book together, there was a story by John Goslowski called The German. And we literally built our book around that story. It's one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful piece in that volume. So I'm happy to present to you today Dr. John Kozlowski. He taught for many years at Eastern Illinois University. He's published both scholarship and creative writings in many journals. And as you know, and if you don't know, they're outside. He's got three books, Lightning and Ashes, Third Winter of War, and The Language of Mules. So please let us welcome John Kozlowski. Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Gregory, for having me here. Uh, I always like to I like to read my poems about my parents. Uh, it, uh, it gives me a lot of joy to do that. My parents aren't with me anymore. And when I read my poems about them, it, it brings them back to me. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the poems I write are about my parents' experiences in, uh, in the concentration camps in Germany. My father spent a little more than four years in the concentration camps in Germany, uh, primarily in Buchenwald, and uh, my mom spent two and a half years in a, in a number of different women's camps in uh, Germany. Uh, they were like, they were, uh, my parents were Polish farm kids. They were Catholics, they weren't Jewish. Uh, but like, like a lot of other people, uh, 15 million of them in fact, they were taken to Germany by the Nazis. Uh, what the Nazis needed was that the Nazis needed to have people to work in their factories and on their farms because all of the German, not all, but many of the German males uh, were off trying to conquer the world. And when you're conquering the world, you can't uh, milk the cow, uh, you know, when the cow needs to be milked. Uh, and so what the Germans did as they, as they advanced uh, into the con countries they were conquering, they would, uh, they would find people who they felt were strong enough to work in these factories and on these farms that were connected to these concentration camps. And uh, they would sh they ship these people back to Germany. Uh, and at the end of the war, there were 15 million of these people in the, uh, in the camps in Germany. Can you all hear me? How's, how's the sound? Can you all, way back there, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read about my parents, uh, poems about my parents for about for about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, then uh, if you have questions, I'd like to, uh, you know, I'd like to listen to some questions about, uh, about my parents or, and their experiences or, or my poems or, uh, or anything you want to talk about. Uh, and then we'll have, uh, we'll have a book signing and uh, a chance to have some refreshments and, and, uh, and, and meet and talk. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm gonna start reading I'm going to read primarily poems about my parents, but I'd like to start with a poem that's not about my parents. Uh, it's a poem based on uh, an experience by a Polish poet who is in Auschwitz. His name was uh, Tadeusz Borowski, and uh, he, he, was in, uh, he, was in Pol he was in Auschwitz uh, from, I think, about 1942 toward the end of the war, and then after the war he was taken to uh, displaced persons camps, refugee camps in, uh, in Germany. Um, 
and I'm starting with a, a poem that I've written about him uh, because he told this story that for me encapsulates a lot of what my parents' experience was like. Uh, I gave a presentation like this once uh, a couple of years back and somebody said, if you could take all your parents' experiences and condense them into one word, what would that word be? And, and I thought, I thought about it. I, there was nothing I could say in response to that question. Uh, I had never thought about trying to reduce everything to one word, uh, uh, very much the opposite. But, but it got me thinking, and I, I, I wrote a poem, and the poem's called Fear, and it's based on a story by uh, Tadeusz Borowski. And I'd like to begin with that poem. During the war, there was only work and death. The work broke you down, filled your stomach with rocks, and, excuse me, I'm going to start again, I'm sorry. During the war, there was only work and death. The work broke you down, filled your stomach with rocks and threw you in the river to drown. The work shoved a bayonet up your ass and twisted the blade until you were dead. In the camps, there was only what we ate and those we worked with, sometimes women. But we never made love, and I'll tell you why. Fear. I remember once a thousand men were working a field with sticks, and trucks came and dumped naked women in front of us. Guards were whipping them to the ovens, and the women screamed and cried out to us, pleaded with their arms stretched out, naked mothers, daughters, and sisters, and not one man moved, not one. Fear will blind you and tie you up like nothing else. It'll whisper, just stand still. Soon it will be over. Don't worry, there's nothing you can do. You will take this fear to the grave with you, I promise you that. And after the war, it was the same. I saw things that were as bad as what happened in the camps. I wish I had had a gun there. I would have pressed it here to my forehead, right here. Better that than what I feel now, this fear. Yeah, the fear was, uh, you know, my parents, uh, you know, there was the fear in the camps, there was the fear before the camps, the fear in the camps, and there was the fear after the camps, after the war. Uh, I remember my dad, when my dad was dying, he died at 78 uh, in a hospital. He survived the war, died in the hospital uh, of cancer. And uh, the one thing that he felt in that hospital while he was dying of cancer was fear. Uh, they gave him morphine to deaden the pain and what he felt instead was all of that fear that uh, he had had in the camps. It all came back to him, and he was convinced that the doctors were, uh, were Nazi guards. He was convinced that my sister and my mother and me, who were there to comfort him when he was dying, were also Nazis, uh, trying to rush him to the ovens. Uh, the fear is always there. Uh, I'd, I'd like to read a, poem, a couple of poems about my mom. The first is called My Mother Was 19. And it's about the day the Germans came to her farm. Uh, she lived in a little farm uh, in the western, uh, eastern end of Poland, outside of the city of Lvov. And um, the, what the Germans would do is they would come and the soldiers would come in and they would surround villages. And uh, they would take the people they wanted to take. And uh, sometimes they would shoot the people that they didn't want to take. Uh, and this is about what happened when the German soldiers came to my mom's, t my mom's house. The poem's called My Mother Was 19. Soldiers from nowhere came to my mom's farm, killed her sister Genya's baby with their heels, shot my grandmother too. One time in the neck, then for kicks in the face lots of times. The soldiers, they saw my aunt Sophie, they didn't care she was a virgin, dressed in a blue dress with tiny white flowers. They raped her, so she couldn't stand up, couldn't lie down, couldn't talk. 
They broke her teeth when they shoved the blue dress in her mouth. If they had had a camera, they would have taken her picture and sent it to her. That's the kind of men they were. Let me tell you, God doesn't give you any favors. He doesn't say, now you've seen this bad thing and tomorrow you'll see some good thing. And when you see it, you'll be smiling. That's bullshit. Um, my mom didn't talk about her experiences for a long time. A lot of what I, I heard from about my mom's experiences came to me from my dad. And my dad was the kind of guy, he couldn't stop talking about what had happened to him. And uh, um, I wrote a poem early on when I started writing these poems about what happened to her after the Germans came and took her to uh, the city of Magdeburg in Germany, which was a clearinghouse for people from the east. Uh, and you were sent to Magdeburg. And from Magdeburg, they would decide which concentration camp you would go to. Um, it's a poem called Cattle Train to Magdeburg. It's about my mother being taken to Germany. My mother still remembers the long train to Magdeburg, the boxcars bleached gray by Baltic winters, the rivers and the cities she had never seen before and would never see again, the sacred Vistula, the smoke-haunted ruins of Warsaw, the river Varta, where horse flesh met steel and fell, the leather fists of pale boys Boys her own age, perhaps 17, perhaps 19, but different. Convinced of their godhood by the cross they wore, different from the one she knew in Lvov. The long twilight journey to Magdeburg. Four days that became six years, six years that became 60. And always a train of boxcars bleached to Baltic gray. Um, like, like I said, I wrote that poem early on about my mom being taken to Magdeburg uh, and it was based on what my dad had told me. And uh, my, my mother read a little bit of English, but she never read much English. And so she, she never read any of my poems until 2002 when I had a book of poems uh, translated, uh, Language of Mules was translated into Polish. And that was one of the poems in uh, Language of Mules. And so she read this poem. And I, uh, when the book came out, I went to her house and I said, Mom, Ma, Ma, I got this book of poems and these are poems about you and Dad. And I, wanna, I want you to read these poems. And she opened the book up and she read that poem, Cattle Trained to Magdeburg. And she said, that's not the way it was. Um, and I said, what, 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 what happened? And uh, so she, she proceeded to tell me what happened. And I wrote another poem uh, called, My Mother Reads My Poem, Cattle Train to Magdeburg. I'll read you that one. Whoops. Sorry. My Mother Reads My Poem, Cattle Train to Magdeburg. She looks at me and says, that's not how it was. I couldn't see anything except when they stopped the boxcars and opened the doors. And I didn't see any of those rivers. And if I did, I didn't know their names. No one said, look, look, this river, that's the Varta. And that river there, that's the Vistula. What I remember is the bodies being pushed out. Sometimes women would kick them out with their feet. Now it sounds terrible. You think we were bad women, but we weren't. We were girls taken from homes alone. Some had seen terrible things done to their families. Even though you're a grown man and a professor, we saw things I don't want to tell you about. My mom, uh, like I say, my mom spent, you know, most of, most of her life, uh, you know, if I would ask her to tell me something about her experiences, uh, 
in the camp, she would wave her hand. She would just say, wave her hand, and she would say, uh, I'm going to tell you one thing. If they give you bread, you eat it, and if they beat you, you run away. And uh, pretty much it's, it's what she would say. After my dad died, uh, which is, she started telling me more of those stories uh, about what did happen. And uh, the next poem I, I want to read is called Grief, and it's about, uh, it's about what happened right after, uh, right after she left, uh, left home and, and went to Germany to go to the concentration camp. Grief. My mother cried for a week, first in the boxcars and then in the camps. Her friends said, Tekla, don't cry. The Germans will shoot you and leave you in the field. But my mother couldn't stop. Even when she had no more tears, she'd cried. Cried the way a dog will gulp for air when it's choking on a stick or some bone it's dug up in a garden and swallowed. The woman in charge gave her a cold look and knocked her down with her fist like a man and then told her if she didn't stop crying, she would call the guards to stop her crying. But my mother couldn't stop. The howling was something loose in her. Nothing could stop. Uh, I'd like to read some poems about my dad. Um, my dad was a, f a farm boy uh, living north of Poznań in a small village. And uh, he went, into, uh, went to the village one day to buy some rope. He needed some rope on the farm. And uh, the village had been surrounded by German soldiers. And they, they went through the village and they picked out the, uh, the, the boys who looked strongest. And they put them on a truck and uh, sent the truck to a train and sent the train to uh, Germany. Uh, my father had n absolutely no education. Uh, he lived on this farm. He was an orphan, never went to school, didn't know anything about uh, where anything was. Uh, you know, he knew the farm. He knew the village. Uh, he probably had heard of Germany because Germany had invaded Poland. Did probably didn't know where Germany was. Um, I, I tried to, um, you know, I would talk to him about about his experiences. And what what always struck me was that uh, early on, he, that he just didn't know anything about where he was going, uh, and and what he would what kind of life he would have in the camps. I wrote a poem about this. It's called "My Father Talks About the uh, Boxcars," and it's about uh, about the train the train ride to Germany. It's in his voice. My father talks about the boxcars. The train would slow and then stop, and we would wait for the doors to grind open so we could see where we were. And sometimes there would be children in the fields bent over boards or a broken plow and we would beg them for water, and they would say, Dear Jesus, if we only could, but the Germans would shoot us. And we would beg the children to tell us where we were, and we'd ask them if they knew where the tracks led. And they'd whisper, the tracks went west to Germany, and maybe further, but they didn't know, maybe to America or France. And we would watch the doors grind back and close with hungry eyes. Um, one of the things my dad always talked about in terms of his experiences in Buchenwald concentration camp was how hungry he was. Um, uh, they, the guys, the prisoners in Buchenwald would live on about 600 calories a day. Uh, 600 calories a day is a bowl of oatmeal, some cranberries thrown in it, and uh, maybe almonds. I mean, that's not what they ate, but that would be about 600 calories. Uh, and they would they would work uh, uh, 12, 13, 14, 16 hours a day, six, seven days a week on 600 calories. Uh, every year, about one out, of, one out of four guys in Buchenwald would die of starvation or mistreatment, uh, brutality. Um, my father once told me a story about how in, uh, in the concentration camp in Buchenwald in January, the, uh, it was snowing, it was about Zero, about 10 degrees below zero outside, and the guards, uh, the, the Nazi guards, called everybody out of the out of the barracks where these men were sleeping. 400 men were sleeping in this barracks, 
they would call these men out and they made them stand in the, uh, in the courtyard and stand there and the German soldiers started doing a roll call and the snow is falling and it's uh, below zero and there's a wind and these men are standing there in their pajamas and uh, the Germans would go get through the roll call and then they'd start the roll call again and then they'd do the roll call again and I, I asked my father I said why why did they just keep keep doing that and he said they were just cruel uh, they had they felt a right to do this and they felt uh, they, they felt they could do this so they would do this and while they were going through the roll, men of course were dying and falling down and uh, uh, disappearing into the snow and the wind and the cold. Uh, my, but as I say, my dad spent a lot of time talking about the, uh, you know, the, the hunger in these camps and the brutality. And uh, I've written some poems about the, the, the hunger. It's called, the first of these poems is called What My Father Ate. My father ate what he couldn't eat, what his mother taught him not to. Brown grass, small chips of wood, the dirt beneath his gray dark fingernails. My father ate the leaves off trees. He ate bark. He ate the flies that tormented the fuel, the, the fly, excuse me, he ate the flies that tormented the mules working in the fields. He ate what would kill a man in the normal course of his life. Leather buttons, cloth caps, anything small enough to get into his mouth. My father ate roots, he ate newspaper. In his slow, clumsy hunger, he did what the birds did. Picked for oats or corn or any kind of seed in the dry dung left by the cows. And when there was nothing to eat, my father searched the ground for pebbles, and he would loosen his saliva, and he would swallow that. And the other men did the same. Um, they lived uh, in, these, the, in this concentration camp, Buchenwald. They would have these barracks buildings, and uh, there would be 300, 400 people sleeping in these barracks buildings. And uh, they would sleep on shelves, uh, there are some photographs of this. Uh, uh, Margaret Burke White, a, a great American photographer, was one of the first people into uh, Buchenwald at the end of the war. And she took photographs of these people sleeping in these shelves. And uh, they would be like bookshelves, uh, and they would be just, you know, rows and rows and rows and rows of these shelves. And you'd, get, you'd have people from floor to ceiling stacked up in these, uh, these things. Um, and um, my father talked about, uh, you know, what it was like sleeping in these, uh, sleeping under these conditions. Um, I wrote a poem called Among Sleeping Strangers. The moon set early and it grew darker and the men settled to sleep in the cold without blankets. Soon it would be spring but it was still cold and it was always cold at night and they did what men always did at night when they were cold. They pressed their bodies together and looked for warmth the way a man who has nothing will look, expecting nothing and thankful to God for the little he finds. And the night was long as it always was, and some men crawled roughly across the others to reach an outside wall to relieve themselves. And some men started coughing, and the coughing entered the dreams of some of the other men, and they remembered the agony of their mothers and grandfathers dying of hunger or cholera. Their lungs coughed up in blood-streaked phlegm. And some men dreamt down deeper and deeper against the cold till they came somehow to that holy moment in the past when they were warm and full and loved. And the sun in those dreams rose early and set late and the days were full of church bells and the early spring flowers that stirred their lives. And in the morning, the men shook away from the cold bodies of their brothers and remembered everything they had lost. Their wives and sisters, their lovers, their homes, their frozen fingers, their fathers, the soil they had been born on, the souls they had been born with, and then they crawled up out of the earth and gathered together 
to work in the dawn. Um, my father hated Germans. Uh, when I was a kid uh, growing up, uh, I once brought a German boy home. We were going to play, and my father said, I don't want that boy in the house. Um, if he was, my dad was watching a TV show and he had, uh, he had uh, German soldiers or somebody who he felt had a German accent or affect, he would turn off the TV, and, but he would become you know, almost enraged. He wasn't a violent man, but you would see him, uh, you know, his hands clenching and uh, forming, uh, forming a pistol or a gun or a, uh, like he was holding a club or something. Um, I wrote a poem about the Germans and... Uh, uh, you know, one of the questions I sometimes get is, uh, uh, well, did the Germans know about what was going on in these camps? And uh, in Germany, they had 725 of these camps. They were scattered all around the country. It's, it's hard to imagine that people didn't know about the camps. It's a poem called The Germans. Uh, it's about the men in the camps. These men belonged to the Germans the way a mule belonged to the Germans. And the Germans stood watching their hunger and then their deaths, watched them as if they were dead trees in the wind and waited for them to fall. And some of the men did. They sank to their knees like children begging forgiveness for sins they couldn't recall. Or they failed to rise when others did and were left in the wet gray fields where the Germans watched them. And the Germans stood watching when the men who were still hungry came back and lifted the dead men and carried their thin bones to the barn and buried them there before eating the soup that wouldn't have kept them alive. The Germans knew a starving man needed more than soup and more than bread, but still they stood and watched. I'm going to drink some water. Um, my father, when he was in the camps in Germany, he did uh, all kinds of work. Uh, part, Buchenwald had, had factories attached to it, had agricultural areas attached to it. Um, he worked in factories, he worked in farms. He also uh, sometimes went out, uh, was taken out in, to the nearby town of Magdeburg, city of Magdeburg, which at that time, uh, toward the end of the war, was being bombed to hell by the Allies. And uh, he would be uh, asked to go and uh, dig for German German people who had been buried in the uh, in the rubble. Um, but uh, this and this is a poem called "The Work He Did in Germany," and it focuses on uh, the agricultural work he did for a time. The work he did in Germany. My father lifts the shovel, sees the dirt, the clod still heavy with snow, and knows that this will always be his life. One shovel and then another shovel until his arms are shaking. He never knows what the guards will say to him. Maybe they'll ask him for a song he knew in Poland that he sang while leading the steaming cows into the woods early in the spring. And my father will smile and sing and ask them if they'd like another. Or maybe they will tell him he is a fool and his mother a pig the farm boys fuck when their own hands are weak from pulling on their sore meat. And my father will shovel in terror and think of the words he will not say. Sirs, we are all brothers. And if this war ever ends, please never tell your children what you've done to me today. Um, poem about my mother. called Worthless. Um, part of the inspiration for the poem uh, comes from uh, uh, a conversation she and I had one time when we were shopping for a couch. And this was many, many years after the war. Uh, and she and my dad had just moved to uh, Phoenix, uh, Arizona. 
and uh, we, were, we were looking for a couch, and we were in a, in a furniture store. And I said to my mother, that's a beautiful couch. And uh, she says, I hate that couch. I said, you hate that couch? It's a beautiful couch. And I said, why do you hate it? She says, it has stripes. And I said, you hate a couch because it has stripes? I said, it doesn't, you know. And, uh, you know, I was, I guess I was being, uh, I was being foolish, and she told me that. Uh, but she, uh, and I had never thought about it. I had never thought about uh, the fact that she had always, you know, had, in the camps had been, had worn a striped, a striped outfit, a striped dress, or a striped blouse, a striped apron, and that uh, she hated stripes. It had never occurred to me. Um, this part of this poem comes from that. It's called Worthless. It's about a time in the, the camps when my mother uh, looks at herself in, in a striped uh, dress and coat. My mother looks at herself in her dress and striped coat and knows she is who she is. Bones and skin and the war has always been with her like an older brother not mean or evil, but hard, never soft, teaching hesitance and patience, teaching her not to put her hand out to take the cup of water or touch the bread. It has always been this way and it will always be this way. War has no beginning, no end. War is the God who breeds and kills. Um, poem called Beats. When my mother got to the camps, uh, when she was first taken to the camps, it was November and uh, the snow was falling and uh, she and these other girls from her village were in these trucks and they were taken out to a, f a field and were told to go out into the field and dig the beets that were in this field. And uh, it was snowing and the ground was frozen and they weren't given any tools to dig these beets up. They just had their hands, uh, their hands and whatever they could pick up uh, to help them dig these beets. And um, my mother told me about, about this, uh, digging for the beets, and uh, wrote a poem about it called The Beets. Excuse me. Here it is. Beets. My mother tells me of the beets she dug up in Germany. They were endless, redder than roses gone bad in an early frost, redder than a grown man's kidney or heart. The first beets she remembers, she was alone in the field, alone without her mother or father near, no sister even. They were all dead, left behind in Poland. The ground was wet and cold, but not soft, never soft. She ate the raw beet, even though she knew they would beat her. She says, sometimes she pretended she was deaf, stupid, crippled, or diseased with typhus or cholera, even with what the children call the French disease, anything to avoid the slap, the whip across her back, the leather fist in her face above her eye. If my mother could have given them her breasts to suck, her womb to penetrate, she would have, just so they wouldn't beat her the way they beat her sister and her mother and the baby. She wonders, what was her reward for living in such a world? It was not love or, or, love or money. She wonders if God will remember her labors. She wonders if there is a God. The... Uh, the war ended in 1945, in the spring of 1945, and uh, I wanted to write a poem about uh, about the end of the war and uh, and give some sense of what my father felt when the war was ended, uh, the happiness uh, that he felt. Uh, and this is the poem I wrote. It's called "In the Spring, the War Ended." For a long time, the war was in the camps. Excuse me, I'm starting again. In the spring, the war ended. For a long time, the war was not in the camps. My father worked in the fields and listened to the wind moving the grain or a guard shouting a command far off or a man dying. 
But in the fall, my father heard the rumbling whisper of American planes, so high like angels cutting through the sky, a thunder even God in heaven would have to listen to. At last, one day he knew the war was there. In the door of the barracks stood a soldier, an American, short like a boy and frightened. And my father marveled at the miracle of his youth and took his hands and embraced him and told him he loved him and loved his mother and father and that he would pray for all his children and even forgive him the sin of taking so long. Um, the war ended in 1945. Um, we spent the next six years in uh, refugee camps in, in Germany. Um, there, like, I, like I said, there were like 15 million people in Germany in the concentration, who had been in the concentration camps, who had survived the concentration camps at the end of the war. And the, it took a long time for the United Nations to figure out what it was going to be doing with these people. Uh, so we spent six years in the, in the refugee camps. Uh, we had the opportunity to go back, my parents had the opportunity to go back to Poland and take my sister and me with them. We, we were born after the war. Uh, but they were afraid to go back to Poland because the communists had taken over uh, Poland. Uh, my uncle, my uncle uh, went back to Poland and uh, the United Nations put him on a train with all these other Poles who wanted to go back to Poland and the train went back to Lwów where, uh, where my uncle was, was from originally, and they got off the train in Lvov, and the, and the communists put him on another train and sent him to Siberia. And uh, my, uh, my uncle and all of these other men, of course, uh, they spent the rest of their lives in Siberia. They, they had spent all of those years in the concentration camps in Germany, and then they went to Siberia. Uh, so my parents, my pa you know, and it, stories like this, uh, stories like this were, were, were told, and my parents were afraid of going back to Poland. So we waited in the refugee camps for um, for an opportunity to finally find you know, some country that would uh, allow us to come back, uh, to come to their country, and live. Um, and uh, I want to read a poem that I don't usually don't usually read. Uh, it's it's. It's about coming to America and going to Ellis Island. We came in 1951 to America, and it's just before um, they, stopped, they stopped processing immigrants through Ellis Island. Uh, we were in the la one of the last batches, and, uh, it's, and I, I was in inspired to read this because I, I drove, drove down the, uh, we drove down from Connecticut to do this, like, to do this reading, and uh, just being in New York, and we went down the, uh, the FDR, uh, uh, what's it, what do you call it? Highway, probably. And, uh, you know, just seeing all of this uh, reminded me of the poem, uh, which is about coming to, coming to New York in 1951. Excuse me. Uh, coming to New York in 1951. Poem's called Lessons. There is no sky, only Ellis Island. The docked ship rusting, rising, falling as we wait for my father. Lost somewhere in a lost somewhere in a crowd of DPs and cast off babushkas. Black market khaki. The gray wool that froze before Moscow and cracked. My father left to buy sausage and bread. Has America already taught him his first lesson? There is no sausage in America. And what is the second lesson? That a Polak who traded an eye for survival can die in a compound so close. And what is the second? That a Polak who traded an eye for survival can die in a compound so close to New York that even, even his son, knowing nothing of Cohen or Jolson or Keeler, can hear their syncopated whispers, the silver of their tapping cakewalks. Um, 
are we how are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to read a couple poems about coming. Couple poems about coming to America. Other than other than that one, um, I wrote a series of poems called. Uh, Hold on. Looking for work in America. When I, when I started thinking about my dad and what it must have been like for him to try to get work in America, and you know, how, do you, how do you say to somebody, well, I've just spent five years in a refugee camp, and before that, I spent four years in Buchenwald concentration camp. Uh, and the, the, the guy you want to get a job from says, well, what, what kind of skills do you have? You know, I mean, what kind of skills does a concentration camp teach you? Uh, I started thinking about that, and the, about the kinds of skills, the kind of resume my dad had when he came to America. Uh, the poem is called, What My Father Brought With Him. My father knew death the way a blind man knows his mother's voice. He had walked through villages in Poland and Germany where only the old were left to search for oats in the fields or beg the soldiers for a cup of milk. My father knew the dead, the way they smelled in their dark, full faces, the clack of their teeth when they were desperate to tell you about their lives. Once, my father watched a woman in the moments before she died take a stick and try to write her name in the mud where she lay. He'd buried children, too. And he knew he could do any kind of work a man could ask him to do. My father knew there was only work or death. He could dig up beets and drag fallen trees without bread or hope. The war taught him how. He came to the States with this and his tools hands that had worked bricks and frozen mud and knew the language the shit bosses spoke. Um, a poem, a, a poem I don't often read, uh, it's called, I, a dream of my father as he was when he first came here looking for work. And it's one of the work poems. And it's about a dream I have. I wake up at the Greyhound station in Chicago, and my father stands there, strong and brave, the young man of my poems, a man who can eat bark and take a blow to his head and ask you if you have another. In each hand, he holds a wooden suitcase, and I ask him if they are heavy. He smiles. Well, yes, naturally, he says. They're made of wood. But he doesn't put the suitcases down. Then he tells me he has come from the war, but remembers little, only one story. And here's the story my father tells me about the war. Somewhere in a gray garden, he once watched a German sergeant chop a chicken up for soup and place the pieces in a pot, everything, even the head and meatless feet. Then he ate all the soup and wrapped the bones in cloth for later. My father tells me, remember this. This is what war is. One man has a chicken and another doesn't. One man is hungry and another isn't. One man is alive and another is dead. I say, there must be more. And he says, no, no, that's all there is. Everything else is the fancy clothes they put on the corpse. Uh, I'm going to read a couple more poems. And that, that I think that'll be it. I want to read a poem about uh, my mother, uh, and it's called What the War Taught Her. Uh, the war made my mother a, a very, uh, very cynical person, uh, not an optimistic person at all. Uh, 
Mm. Poem's called What the War Taught Her. Here it is. What the war taught her. My mother learned that sex is bad. Men are worthless. It is always cold and there is never enough to eat. She learned that if you are stupid with your hands, you will not survive the winter, even if you survive the fall. My mother learned that only the young survive the camps. The old people are left in piles like worthless paper, and babies are scarce like chickens and bread. My mother learned that the world is a broken place where no birds sing, and even angels can't bear the sorrows God gives them. She learned that you don't pray your enemies will not torment you, you only pray that they won't kill you. Um, and then, uh, poem about my dad, what my father believed. What my father believed. My father didn't know about the Rock of Ages, or bringing in the sheaves, or Jacob's ladder, or gathering at the beautiful river, the beautiful river that, throws, that flows beneath the throne of God. He'd never heard of the Baltimore Catechism either, and he didn't know that the purpose of life was to love, honor, and serve God. My father had been to the village church as a boy in Poland, and he knew he was Catholic because his mother and father were buried in a cemetery under wooden crosses. His sister Catherine was buried there too. The day their mother died, Catherine took to the kitchen corner where the stove sat and cried. She wouldn't eat or drink, she just cried until she died there, died of a broken heart. She was three or four years old, he was five. What my dad knew about the nature of God and religion came from the sermons the priests told at Mass, and this got mixed up with his own life. He knew living was hard, and that even children are meant to suffer. Sometimes, when he was drinking, he'd ask, didn't God send his only son here to suffer? My father believed we are here to lift logs that can't be lifted, to hammer steel nails so bent they crack when we hit them. In the slave labor camps in Germany, he'd seen men try to do the impossible and fail. My father believed life is hard and we should help each other. If you see someone on a cross, his weight pulling him down and breaking his muscles, you should try to lift him, even if only for a minute, even though you know lifting won't save him. Thank you. It's painful reading these things, and uh, I, do, I do a lot of these, uh, I do, I, I don't do, a, you know, I do, I do presentations. Uh, I do a number of presentations. I, I do presentations for school kids, uh, church groups, uh, uh, people in uh, t temples, synagogues, uh, and it, it, I don't think it ever gets less easy to do the, do the presentations. Uh, for me, one of the things that happens when I do a presentation like this is, you know, I hear my parents' voices, you know, in the, in the poem uh, where, where my mom uh, says, you know, that's not the way it was, <laughs> when she, and you know, and boy, you know, I, I hear that, and I hear her saying that. Uh, and so, you know, my parents aren't, aren't with me anymore, and so all of that comes back every time I read the poems. And then, you know, their experiences, they just, they never, they never, you know, I was going to say they never survived their experiences, but they never survived their, their experiences. Uh, the war was always with them, and the things that had happened to them in the war were always with them. Uh, and it just, you know, I remember, I remember seeing my mother just before she died, and it was like, you know, it was like she had just stepped out of the, she had, she had, it's like she had just been liberated, and uh, the kind of brutality she had experienced in the camps, I mean, it was still so much a part of her. It's, yeah, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to step away from.
the justification, the, you know, they, you know, they, 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 they blamed the Germans. I mean, the, they saw it, they saw it as a, you know, a bad thing. I mean, in, in terms of a cosmic justification, you know, they just saw it as a, you know, one bad thing happening to them caused by the Germans. Uh, whether or not there was some, I don't think they ever felt there was any kind of, that it, it fit into God's plan somehow, is, is, you know, that, it, that there was some kind of, that it made some kind of sense. Uh, you know, there was just too much pain, too much suffering to, uh, to make it, to see it as having some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of justification. Yeah, I'm sorry. A lot of work that I find personally inspiring. Uh, Primo Levi's survival in Auschwitz. Uh, um, I I teach a course. Uh, I'm I'm retired, but I teach a course online, in order to get uh, social security credits. <laughs> uh, uh, the course is called War Stories, and uh, I teach enemies of love. Isaac Besheva Singer's uh, enemies of love story in the course all the time. Um, I've. I've taught the Ma I've taught Mouse uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse uh, a number of times in, in that course and in other courses. I find a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, writing uh, about the, about the Holocaust, the war, what happened, uh, inspiring. Mostly, it's uh, you know, I write poetry, but what I what I mostly read is uh, memoir. Uh, I, I read memoir, and I'm interested in memoir, and so I'm always reading uh, uh, memoirs about the, those experiences. Yeah. When my mother was dying, my, my parents were Catholic. Uh, when my mother was dying, uh, I said to my mom, Mom, you want me to get you a priest so that he can hear your, uh, your last confession, give you the last sacraments? And she said, no. She was dying. I mean, she was two, two weeks away from death, and she would not, she would not talk to a priest. She wouldn't want, didn't want a priest coming in. I said, Mom, you, know, you're, you, know, you sure you don't want? She said, no priest has ever come back from heaven to tell us what, uh, what's really there. And... Uh, and it was, you know, she, when I was a child growing up, she did go to church with my father. My father was very religious. Uh, and his faith was strengthened by, by the experience. Uh, as he grew older and older, in fact, he, he became more devout. Uh, was it strengthened because he actually survived himself? And what was the basis of the, uh, the justification of the strengthening of you know, his faith? You I'm, know, I'm not, uh, he, he felt, you know, he, he, he had a, a sincere belief in 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 Jesus Christ, and in the sense that Jesus was put here as a model, and that uh, as a model for behavior, and uh, and yeah, everything finally came down to that. Uh, you know, the baby Jesus for him, and uh, you would talk to him, and he had a child's faith. It wasn't. It wasn't a sophisticated faith. Uh, you know, I say in the poem, uh, the last one I read, uh, what my father believed. Yeah, he didn't know about the Rock of Ages. He never, he, my father couldn't read. Uh, he, you know, all he knew was what he heard and, uh, and how that got mixed up with his own life. And, uh, but it's his faith, it was his faith in, uh, in Jesus that, uh, that, that was important to him. And so that, but it was a, it was a, a real child's uh, faith, uh, you know, I remember as, as a child myself, if I did something that my father thought was uh, you know, wrong, uh, my father would say, you know, oh, you know baby Jesus, you know, you're hurting baby Jesus. It was that kind of, uh, that kind of faith. Yeah. Um, you know, I was going to ask you something. Oh, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, I was uh, you said your parents met in a, in a DP camp, yeah? Yeah. Did they get married very? Or did they get married immediately? Yeah. My f yeah. My father said uh, when the war ended. <laughs> when the war ended, everybody first they had something to eat, and then they got married. And uh, and it, it sometimes felt like that. Uh, we have uh, photographs from the uh, the refugee camps, and uh, there, you know, a lot of photographs of weddings, just little snapshots of weddings. My sister said, "Never write about me," and uh, because my sister's my my sister's relationship with my mother was such a bad relationship uh, that she didn't. My sister didn't want to be reminded of anything that happened between the two of them. Um, 
And so that she, she said, you know, don't write about me. I, I wrote about her anyway. Uh, because I figured, well, she's never going to read this book. Uh, uh, but my, my mother, it was funny, my parents, when I first started doing these uh, presentations, when I first started writing poems about my parents, uh, they didn't know I was writing poems about them. But, you know, a after years of doing this, and I would, I would, you know, I would tell them I was, I was writing poems about them. And uh, my father consciously started telling me more and more stories. Uh, about about his experiences, and my mother also, uh, uh, toward the end of her life, started telling me more stories. But there are stories that she wouldn't tell. Uh, I, in that one poem, uh, the my mother reads "Cattle Train to Magdeburg." At the end of the poem, my my mother says, at the at the end of the conversation she and I had, she said, "There were things that happened that I won't tell you about." And one of the things that she never talked about was her own sexual brutaliz brutalization by the Nazis, by the Germans. Uh, you know, there was, I've read other things, I've done a lot of research about what happened to women who were, who were taken to, these, uh, to the concentration camps. A lot of sexual brutalization. And uh, it's something my mother, I'm, my mother never talked about. And, I'm, and, and I feel that she probably didn't want to, uh, want to, you know, didn't want to, didn't want to tell me. For a long time, she wouldn't tell me anything. And I, I feel that, I feel that she didn't want to tell me anything because she was protecting me at that time. Okay. Uh, when I was a child, I remember one time she got a letter from Poland, and uh, she was always looking for a uh, family that had been lost. She had came from a big family, and so she was always trying to f contact the Red Cross to, uh, to, so that she could connect with maybe maybe a brother or sister who had survived the war, and she would get letters sometimes from the Red Cross, sometimes, sometimes from Poland, from you know, people she knew. And uh, she, would, she couldn't, she wouldn't read these letters out loud to us. There were things in these letters that she didn't want to, uh, to share with us. And I think it was because were, these letters were so painful. She would take these letters that she would get and she'd go into the bedroom and she'd close the door and she'd read the letters uh, behind these closed doors. And as kids, my sister and I would put our, you know, we'd listen in to see what she was, what was going on. And uh, we'd press our ears to the door and she would be weeping inside uh, in those rooms. Um, I, 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 was, I was curious about those letters that she would get. And I knew that she saved them for years, she saved the letters. And toward the end of her life, I asked her if I could have the letters. And we were sorting through her papers. Getting, getting ready for the end. And I said to her, can I have those letters that you received from Poland? And she said, I destroyed them all. And so there, were, there, there must have been things, and there, must have, there, were, there were probably things that, uh, that, that she, didn't, she didn't want to pass on to me. Yeah. No, I had an opportunity. I missed it. <laughs> uh, they went back. They went back in 1988, uh, just before the communists left, and uh, it was it was a very difficult summer for us. Um, my wife was we were moving across country, and uh, I missed that opportunity. Uh, when they went when they went back, it had all changed so much. Uh, one of the things my mom did was she went back to the village that she had come from. And she, she wanted to see the house, and she wanted to see if anybody remembered her. And she wanted to find, to see if, the, if there was a grave, if they had uh, put up a grave for her mother, uh, her mother and her sister Genya and the Genya's baby. If the, yeah. And uh, my mother went back there looking, and uh, nobody, you know, my mother said, well, we lived in this house. And, uh, you know, when, and nobody, you know, nobody would, uh, would recognize that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I went back to Poland and I had a book that came out in 2002 and I went back there for uh, I was doing a, a series of readings and uh I uh called my mom up and I said, "Mom, I'm going to Poland." She said, "Don't go." <laughs> she said she said I had a dream last night and in the dream you were on a train and they took you off the train and they threw you into the river and dogs ate you. And I said, I said, 
Ma, I've got to go. I've got a book. And uh, she said, oh, no. And, it, and finally, we had to stop talking about it because, you know, I was making plans for this trip. And it was really, she was just, she wouldn't stop about how uh, it was a bad thing to go to Poland. These terrible things would happen. I do presentations like this in high school sometimes. And people will, students will assume that there's one way, there's one way of responding, of, of responding to all of this, uh, these things that happen. And for me, it's, it, it's not that way at all. It's just that there are so many different ways of responding. When I was, when I was four years old, my father was telling me about, uh, I've got a poem about it. I've got, my father was telling me about German soldiers cutting off women's breasts with bayonets. And I'm thinking, you know, I think back on it now. I was four years old, and my father's telling me these stories. That's crazy. You know, it just seems like it's completely inappropriate. Uh, but then, you know, and when my sister, when my daughter, we have a daughter, my wife and I have a daughter, uh, when she got to be about five or six, I started wondering, well, what should I tell her? You know, should I be like my father and tell her all of these terrible things? And I just, you know. But then you said your father was a symbol farmer in Poland, yeah. and maybe, you know, modern psychology and all those things yeah. that not, you know, he didn't think about the trauma yeah. Yeah. or, yeah. you know, he, how it... Yeah, he, it may have not, uh, yeah, it may have not, uh, he, he may have not thought about uh, what, what the effect of that was uh, on me and my sister. I don't know. Uh, but, and we grew up in a neighborhood. We grew up in a neighborhood in Chicago with a lot of survivors, mm -hmm. and there were so that you know, I was hearing it from my father, but I was also hearing stories from the children of, of other survivors, mm -hmm. and you know, kids passing these, you know, telling these stories among each other.